Let me begin with the analogy of a flashlight or a torch. Your awareness is like a flashlight. Think about it. You can direct your awareness to wherever you want. Direct your awareness right now, for example, to the chair in which you are sitting and the fact that you're sitting in it. And all of a sudden you become conscious of the weight of your hips pressing into the chair on which you're sitting. Okay. What does a flashlight do? A flashlight lights up whatever you shine it on. You shine it on the floor, it lights up the floor. You shine it on the ceiling and the ceiling becomes light. Your awareness is exactly like that. You can decide what you're going to shine the flashlight of your awareness on and that gets lit up. Right now, most of us are shining the flashlight of our awareness on what could happen. When is all this going to end? What will happen to my job? How about my finances? What about my loved ones? Will I become sick? Will my loved ones become sick? So we're shining the flashlight of our awareness on all of the things that could happen. And as you do that, you pick up the emotions associated with that and bring it back to where you are and you're worried and anxious and fearful. You have a way out. Shine the flashlight of your awareness on what can I do right now? What is it that lies at hand that what can I do? Are you concerned about loved ones? Give them a call. Are they fearful and anxious? That's because they're shining the flashlight of their awareness on what could happen. Bring them back to the present. Talk about happy times that you had together. Maybe a vacation that you undertook. Get them to talk about some time in their life when they were happy and peaceful and content and let their awareness go there. <clears throat> there is a concept called mental chatter that I want to introduce to you. Mental chatter is an internal monologue that's going on in our heads all the time. It begins when we get up in the morning, is with us throughout the day and uh, causes no end of grief to us. The kind of thing that goes, oh my God, there's so much work to do. I don't have enough time to do it all. Uh, have I returned that phone call? These are the things I must do. My life is not where I would like it to be. All of that is mental chatter. Mental chatter causes an immense amount of problem. And mental chatter causes us problems, not because it is there, because mental chatter has always been a part of our life. Mental chatter causes a problem because we don't observe our mental chatter, we become our mental chatter. Imagine it's a bright sunny day and you're lying in a grassy field and the temperature is perfect and you look up at the sky and there are clouds in the sky. You shut your eyes. Ten minutes later those clouds have gone and there are fresh clouds in the sky. Mental chatter is like that, like clouds in the, in the sky. As long as you're observing that, there is no problem at all. They come and they go. But we have a tendency to identify, to become our mental chatter. And when we become our mental chatter, they take us to all kinds of places that we don't want to go. There is a very powerful teaching by the Buddha, and it's called the parable of the second arrow. And Buddha asks his student Ananda, Ananda, if an arrow would have hit you in the arm, would it not be very painful? Ananda nods and said, yes, Lord, it would be very painful. And if a second arrow would have hit you exactly where the first arrow hit you, would it not be even more painful? Yes, Lord, it would be even more painful. Why then do you shoot the second arrow? Now, this requires a little explanation. And I will tell you a story. This is actually a story which uh, was narrated in a TED talk by Guy Finch. It's a very powerful story. It talks about a woman who uh, <clears throat> had a very messy divorce and she was broken up. And it took her a long time to put her life together, but she does. And eventually she decides she's ready to explore again. So she goes to the internet sites, fill in a, fills in a profile, and she meets this man who's very successful and uh, intelligent, etc., etc. And most of all, he seems really into her. So after some time emailing and uh, uh, talking on the phone, they decide to meet in an upscale Manhattan cafe. 
and she's all excited and buys a new dress and they meet. And 15 minutes into that meeting, he gets up, he tosses his napkin on the table and says, I'm not interested and walks out. And she's crushed. She's so crushed that the only thing she can do is call her friend and her friend says, well, why are you surprised? You have nothing interesting to say and you have fat hips. Why would any intelligent, successful man pay any attention to you? Now, are you shocked that a friend would say something at a time like this? Probably. But what if I told you that it wasn't her friend who said this, it's what she told herself? You'd be much less surprised. That is the second arrow. Being rejected is painful enough and being told that she is physically unattractive and uninteresting, has nothing good to say, doesn't make things any better. The important thing for you to remember is that the second arrow is always delivered by means of mental chatter. Let me repeat that. The second arrow is always delivered by means of mental chatter. And all of us are wonderful at shooting second arrows at ourselves. We make a mistake in our job and we say, oh my God, I am so stupid. We uh, <clears throat> have a blow up with uh, our child or our uh, partner and uh, we say, oh, oh but I should have known better. I'm always doing things that are wrong. And we blame others. And right now in the middle of the coronavirus crisis, all the thoughts that we have about what could happen, what I should have done differently, all of that is mental chatter. All of that is second arrows. What is the best method for avoiding shooting second arrows at yourself? The best, best method by far is to become aware that you're doing it. The moment you become aware that you're shooting second arrows at yourself, they become much less powerful. And as you constantly develop this awareness, you find that you do it less and less often. You'll probably always be doing it, always be doing it because you've been conditioned to do that, but you will do it much less frequently and that will make a huge difference in your life. Let me share another concept with you, which is particularly relevant to these times. We are living in fear, we're living in doubt, and we're living in anxiety. And the reason for that is where we direct our mental chatter. We direct our mental chatter to all the things that are wrong in our lives that we would like to have fixed. Now, life has always been uncertain. Things have always come from nowhere to upset all our carefully laid plans. Look back on your life. Can you recall any instance when things seem to be proceeding normally and something totally, totally unexpected happened and all of a sudden all your plans were gone? I'm sure you can. You can probably remember many such instances. So can I. For example, right now, <clears throat> my wife and I are both tennis fans and we've been to the French Open numerous times and the America, the US Open every year. We went to the Australian Open a couple of years back. This is the year that we were going to Wimbledon. And I bought the tickets almost a year ago and I never ever thought we would not be able to go because we were locked up and because there are no planes flying. Unexpected stuff always happens. So this notion we have that things are unsettled now is fiction. Things have always been unsettled, but in our heads, we thought that they were settled and we'd be able to live life as we would like it to. All that's happened now is that it has been brought home to us very powerfully that this is not true. We do not have control. We never had control. We never have, will have control, but that's fine. Because since we never had it anyway, why are we particularly upset now? We're particularly upset now because we're shining the flashlight of our awareness on the thought that before I had control and now I don't have control and I don't like it. You don't have to do that. Shine the flashlight of your awareness on two things. First of all, shine it on what is one action I can take today. And whatever your action that you can take today is do it, but do it mindfully. 
a lot of the time, whenever we're involved in any action, we find that we're not in effect, not effective, and we find that we're stressed out because of our mental chatter. It's constantly, constantly telling us, "Oh my God, there's so much to do. You'll never be able to finish it. Why are you so slow? Why can't you do things better?" All of that, as I said, is mental chatter with which you are identifying, but don't identify with it. Let them come, let them drift off and pour your attention onto what is the task that you're doing. And every time your mental chatter tries to take you away, gently detach it and bring it down to whatever action you're, you're doing. If you're washing the dishes, wash the dishes. If you're writing a report, write the report. If you're on a phone call with someone, don't check your email, don't look around and see what else you can do. Focus on that person, listen to the intonations of the voice. So as you mindfully direct your attention to whatever it is you're doing at that moment, you will find the task becomes pleasurable and the fear recedes. Now, again, as I mentioned, your awareness is like a flashlight. Shine the flashlight of your awareness on the many, many things that are wonderful in your life. Right now, even as you're listening to me, do you have to bother about whether you're going to have dinner or breakfast tomorrow? Do you have a roof over your head? Are you in a position where you have a computer or some device by which you can hear me as of right now? Do you have a roof over your head? Now, those are things to be grateful for, right? Because in a big chunk of the world, people don't have any of that. But you don't think about that. You think about how you are nervous and stressed out. That's because of where you are shining the flashlight of your awareness on. So starting immediately, start five minutes before you go to bed, shine the flashlight of your awareness on the many, many things that are good in your life and actually experience the feeling of gratitude. This is not a thinking exercise. This is a feeling exercise. So if you're a type A individual who lives in your head, there is a tendency to think gratitude, good health, check, food to eat, check, roof overhead, check. It doesn't work like that. You actually have to experience the feeling. So how do you move from thinking gratitude to feeling gratitude? Once again, you use your awareness. Look at the things in your life which you recognize are wonderful and you should feel grateful for. Dwell on that, shine the flashlight of your awareness on that and keep it there. And then tie it up, tell yourself stories about it and tie it up to the other things in your life that you're grateful for. Let me give you an example. So you have food to eat. Because you have food to eat, you're not always hungry and thinking about how hungry you are and thinking about when you can eat and what you will eat. Because you're not obsessed with this, when your child falls down and hurts herself, you can rush up to comfort her and be there. When your client calls and he has a problem, you can get on a Zoom call and help troubleshoot it or, or talk on the phone and help him resolve that. Because you're not constantly thinking of food, because you're not constantly hungry, you can have a good night's sleep. And by the way, you also have a good night's sleep because you have a bed to sleep in. When you get up in the morning, you actually get to make the good, make the bed. Is that something to be happy and grateful for? Absolutely. There is a wonderful book by Admiral McRaven. At one time, he was head of the U.S. Special Forces, and it's called Make Your Bed. And he talks about if you're going to be successful in the morning, if you're going to be successful in life, it's wonderful if you can get into a lot of small habits which you will uh, maintain for your life. And these small habits will have a big impact on your life. And the, one of the very first items on the list is make your bed. So because you have a bed, you can make your bed and instill that habit in yourself. And by the way, one of the reasons you can make your bed is you've got a roof over your head. And there are many people, such as those who were affected by the tornadoes which struck uh, mid-America last week, don't have a roof over their heads. So by constantly thinking about the things for which you know you should be grateful and telling yourself stories about that and seeing what the implications are in your life, if you continue to do that, you will find that gradually the thinking of appreciation and gratitude becomes the feeling of appreciation 
and gratitude. Persist until it happens. When you get up in the morning, don't go immediately to the space of, oh my God, there's so much to do and I don't have enough time to do it all. Instead, bring that feeling of appreciation and gratitude back. Bathe in it. Immerse yourself in it. Wallow in it. Shower in it. In fact, it is my hope that you will eventually be able to get to the point where your default emotional domain is that of appreciation and gratitude. And why would I like that for you? I would like that for you because when your default emotional domain is one of appreciation and gratitude, you're not anxious, you're not fearful, you're not worried. These cannot coexist. When you are in the domain of appreciation, gra gratitude, all of these negative emotions, anger, fear, worry, they go away. They cannot live together. And from that emotional domain of appreciation, gratitude, it is possible for you to look at your life and say, these are the things I would like to fix. But you're reaching out to fix them from the space of happiness and uh, <clears throat> of gratitude. And that makes a huge difference in your effectiveness in dealing with them. Let me move on. And there's something that we do. This is another very powerful concept I'm about to share with you. There is something that we do. We do it multiple times every day. And we don't even recognize that we're doing it. But it uh, has a very negative impact on our life. Whenever something happens, we very quickly judge it in our heads. And we label it, this is good or this is bad. And nothing is neutral. All things are either somewhat good or somewhat, get, somewhat bad. You know, you fall down and hurt yourself. This is bad. You may have to remain in bed for a week while you heal. This is really bad. Now, let me tell you a tale. This comes from the Sufi tradition. And there are many versions of this tale, but I like the one that I'm about to share with you. There was a man and his son, and they lived in a beautiful valley, and they were very happy. But they were also very poor. And the man got sick and tired of being poor. He decided he would become a rich man. And he decided he would become a rich man by breeding horses. He bought a stallion. He didn't have any money to buy a stallion, so he borrowed from the neighbors. And the very day he got the stallion, it kicked the top bar loose from the paddock where he housed it and ran away. And the neighbors came around and said, commiserating, and they said, you were going to become a rich man, but your stallion has run away. You still owe us money. You are in a hole. And the man shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows. That stallion fell in with a group of wild horses, and they were close to where the man lived, so he was able to entice them into the paddock, which he had repaired. So escape was no longer possible. So all of a sudden, now he had the stallion back plus a dozen wild horses. And by the standards of that village, that made him a rich man. So the neighbors came around and said, we thought you were destitute, but fortune has smiled upon you. How lucky you are. And the man shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? The man and his son started to break the horses so they could sell them on the market. And one of the horses threw the man's son and uh, stomped on his leg and it broke and it healed crooked. And the neighbors said he was such a fine young lad and now he'll never be able to find a girl to marry him. And the man shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? That summer, the king of the country declared war on a neighboring country and press gangs moved through the villages, rounding up all the able-bodied young men. But this man's son was spared because he had a crooked leg. And the neighbors had tears in their eyes as they came and said, we don't know if we'll ever see our sons alive, but you still have your son with you. How fortunate you are. And he shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? And it goes on like that forever. There is a very important lesson that's hidden in this fable. Have you ever had something happen to you that at the time it happened, you thought this is terrible? But looking back upon it with the perspective of time and perhaps greater wisdom, you can say, hey, that wasn't terrible after all. Maybe even it was a good thing. I was conducting a workshop for a group of entrepreneurs earlier this week, and one of the persons said, Professor Rao, I can relate to this perfectly. Uh, he was in a technology uh, business, 
And one of his key employees was the only one who really understood how a very key part of the technology worked. And suddenly he quit with no notice. So oh, the person felt cheap, you know, that this is terrible. I, you know, I'm quite, my business is going to fail. But he went out through his contacts and hired someone who seemed okay. And this person not only grew into the role, but he was also a very good manager. So he built a team of people who had expertise in that and trained other people in the company on how to troubleshoot for customers. So now all of a sudden, he has a strong department, not dependent on any one person, and that department is functioning better than it ever did before. So, you know, his employee leaving, you said, was actually the best thing that could have happened to me. In your life, think about it. Whenever an event occurs, it does not cause suffering. Let me repeat that. Whenever an event occurs, any event, it does not cause suffering. Suffering happens the instant you decide, this is bad, this is terrible, I cannot bear it. Let's say you're in business and you lose your biggest customer. So now you have a lot of spare capacity. But if you lose your biggest customer and you say, oh my God, what am I going to do? My business will fail. Will I have to lay off employees? This is terrible. The moment you decide this is terrible, at that moment, suffering begins. Suffering doesn't begin when something happens, any event. Suffering begins the moment you label that event, this is bad, this is terrible. So ask yourself a question, whenever something happens and you say, oh my God, this is bad, before you stick the bad thing label on it, ask yourself, is this true? Is there any possible set of circumstances by which in X years this could turn out to be good? Is it possible? Just asking yourself that question will move you to a different emotional domain. And if you then ask yourself the next question, is there anything I can do to make it happen? And all of a sudden you move from the realm of despair to the realm of possibility. Take what's happening right now with the coronavirus. You're probably labeling all the things bad. I can't go out. I don't have freedom. I can't travel by, you know, to distant countries. I can't go on vacation. All of this is bad. Don't label it this is bad because the moment you do, you start suffering. Instead, label it this happened. Okay, so now this happened and what are you going to do about it? And all of a sudden, you'll find all kinds of ways in which you can be productive, in which you can make your life richer, and more important, how you can help persons who are in your life, including your employees, if you're a businessman, also help make their lives better. Look, we are facing it. Whether we like it or not, there's not much we can do on an individual level to do it. If you go on a downward spiral, we're helping neither ourselves nor anybody else. But we don't have to go on a downward spiral. And the first step towards doing that is not to label what happened to us. This is terrible. This is bad. I can't bear it. Because the moment you say I can't bear it, that indeed is what happens. So remember this. Ask yourself when something happens, good thing, bad thing, who knows? And when you don't know it, why assume it is a bad thing? See if it can be a good thing and see what you can do proactively to make it a good thing. So I've shared a number of concepts with you. Let me share one final uh, story or concept rather. I don't have time to go into it in great detail, but it's very powerful. We live our lives in the following way. We set a goal for ourselves, work very hard, and uh, we succeed. Life is a blast. We set a goal for ourselves. We try very hard to achieve it and we fail. We live our lives oscillating on a sinusoidal curve between elation and despair, and we spend too much time on the despair end of the spectrum. It's a lousy way to live. There is an alternative. Once you have set a goal for yourself, forget about the goal. Instead, put all of your emotional energy into what are the actions that I have to undertake in order to meet the goal. 
forget about the goal once you have set it. The importance of the goal is that it establishes direction. Once the direction has been established, forget about it and put all your energy, your emotional thoughts into what do I have to do to accomplish the goal. When you do that, two things happen. You actually begin to enjoy the journey. When you are working towards a goal, the goal is a destination. When you're obsessed with the destination, you miss the journey. And the journey is the only thing you have. The journey is with you always. The destination is a mirage. You get there, you tarry a few minutes, you're gone someplace else. The journey is your life. The journey is with you always. The journey is the only thing you have. But when you focus on the journey, the probability that you'll get to the destination that you actually want is much higher. Invest in the process. Do not invest in the outcome. You know, people talk about, I want to climb Mount Everest. How much time do you spend on top of Mount Everest? A few minutes to a half hour max. You get up there, your buddy takes a picture of you, your buddy gets up there, you take a picture of him, and then you're on your way down and you hope you don't get killed in an avalanche. So if you're going to climb Mount Everest, you better enjoy the weeks and months of acclimatization on Base Camp 1, Base Camp 2, and so on. It's exactly the same way in life. Set a goal for yourself. Set an ambitious stretch goal, but recognize that this goal establishes direction. Once, once the direction has been established, forget about the goal, pour all of your emotional energy into one of the actions that I have to take to undertake the goal. And then you actually start enjoying what you're doing. You're enjoying the journey and the probability that you'll get to the goal you want actually increases. John Wooden was the basketball coach for the University of California at Los Angeles and had a one of the best records of any coaches in any field. He was the first person to reach the Basketball Hall of Fame, both as a player and as a coach. And he used to say, when I'm working with a new team, I never talked about winning or outscoring opponents. I always talked about when it is over and you look in the mirror, did you do the best you were capable of? If you did the best you were capable of, the score really doesn't matter. But if you did the best you were capable of, I suspect you will find the score to your liking. That is a perfect articulation of invest in the process do not invest in the outcome. The outcome is beyond your control. There's nothing you can do about it. But if you put all of your emotional energy into your actions, the probability that you will reach the outcome you want increases. And as important, you will find that you enjoy every step of the journey. Remember, the journey is the only thing you have. The outcome is a mirage. You get there, you spend a few hours, days, and then you're off someplace else. Invest in the process. Do not invest in the outcome. Be appreciative in gratitude. Remember, good thing, bad thing, who knows? And with that, I am done. Have a terrific evening and a great week.